Thanks everyone for, for joining us, for joining this session. Um, so as Liz says, um, with, and as you all know, having signed up for it, we're gonna be talking about pandemic ethics today. Um, so before I kind of uh, get into the core bit of what I want to talk about, I just want to kind of start off by noting a kind of alternative interpretation of the phrase pandemic ethics than the one I'll be focusing on. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll be talking and I assume most of you expected me to talk about some particular ethical issues that have been raised by the pandemic. But I think it's also just worth briefly noting that another possible way we might understand that phrase pandemic ethics is um, as the practice of doing ethics during a pandemic. Um, of thinking about ethics during pandemic. Um, so, I mean, one, one observation I might make is just that uh, I think a lesson we can learn from uh, having tried to do ethics during this pandemic, and in particular, tried to do ethics that's useful and translatable into policy during the pandemic, is that this isn't an ideal situation in which to be thinking about these ethical issues. Um, and as I'll, as I'll suggest, when I kind of talk about some more specific issues, um, most of these are not new eth ethical issues, right? Most of these are not unique to this pandemic. They're issues that the pandemic has perhaps brought to the forefront of our minds, brought to the forefront of our uh, national and global conversation, uh, and perhaps brought to the forefront of our, of our media. But they are... Um, pretty much all ethical issues that have been being thought about for a long time. Um, and so I suppose I just want to kind of begin by making the point that um, we should be thinking about these ethical issues more and we should be trying to make some progress on them uh, while we're not in the middle of a global emergency. Um, and I think that's one lesson we can draw. So, as I say, I'm going to touch on a number of specific ethical issues. Um, but when I was thinking about this session, the thought of trying to kind of rattle through all the ethical issues that the pandemic has has kind of brought to uh, brought to our attention was uh, well, it just seemed impossible. So what I've done instead, which I hope will be helpful, is to kind of sort a number of these ethical issues into three broad themes or three broad tensions that I think have been identified as the pandemic has, on, has, has kind of gone on. And as I say, these are not new ethical problems, um, but they are ethical problems that maybe the pandemic has brought our attention to a bit more sharply. And so these three themes or these three tensions are, first of all, a, a tension between efficiency and fairness, Second of all, a kind of three-way tension between the individual, the state, and community. And finally, uh, and I'll talk about this one a little more briefly, a, a kind of tension that we're seeing right now between the nation and, and the world. Okay, so these are all uh, real headlines. Um, they're all headlines from um, fairly recent, I think probably all from the past three months. Um, and they all relate to broadly the allocation of resources during the pandemic. So um, if we think about this, this tension between efficiency and fairness, there are two obvious kinds of healthcare resources that really exemplify that and that have been really prominent in our kind of national discussion during this pandemic. Um, one of those is access to intensive care. So admission to intensive care units, access to intensive care beds and ventilators uh, and triage. And the second of these is prioritization in terms of access to vaccines. Um, now in both of those areas, a number of countries, including the UK, have approached both of these problems from what can largely be seen as a kind of maximizing approach. Um, and in particular, both access to intensive care and the prioritization approach the government has taken to vaccination has been pretty explicitly with the goal of 
saving the most number of lives. So if you take the headline at the top of this slide, um, when there was a kind of uh, out, uh, outcry from uh, teachers that they should be boosted up in terms of prioritization in access to the vaccination, into vaccination program, um, the response from government officials, or at least one of the main responses, was that even if there was a case for this, trying to do this in the middle of an ongoing vaccination program, trying to switch the level of prioritization that we already had, would complicate things and would eventually mean that we save fewer lives. Because trying to take into account all these various factors, rather than going with the reasonably straightforward approach of um, age-based prioritization, with the obvious exception of those who are shielding. That's a simple approach. And that approach was justified in part because it would lead to the biggest number of lives saved. So I think um, there are a number of things we can say about this, but two main points I think are worth making. The first of these is that saving the most lives is not the only way that we might understand this idea of maximization. So in general, the government's approach, and indeed this is a popular approach in healthcare allocation, is the thought that when we have a limited set of resources, we should aim to get the most good out of those resources that we can, right? So we've only got so many vaccines at any one time, we've only got so many intensive care beds or intensive care staff, and what we should do is we should try to make sure that we use those resources in the most efficient way possible so that we can get the most good out of them. Now, saving the most lives is one way of understanding that idea of producing the most good. And it's a, you know, it has the advantage of being a fairly intuitive one that a lot of members of the public will see as a kind of obvious thing that we should be aiming for. But it's not the only way that we can understand the idea of efficiency. It's not the only way that philosophers, economists, and other people working in healthcare allocation have understood that idea. So as well as trying to save the most lives, many people have argued that actually what we should be doing is producing the most years of life saved. So for instance, rather than treating equally, saving the life of a person who can only be expected to live for another few months and saving the life of a person who is likely to live for several more decades, many people argue that we should prioritize those individuals who are expected to live longer once their life has been saved. And so in general, not absolutely, but in general, that's going to mean prioritizing the young. Even more extremely, we might focus not only on the number of years of life that can be saved, but on the quality of those years. So as well as advocating that we should save more, life, more years of life rather than fewer, some people argue that we should, we should uh, weight the number of years that we get by saving particular people according to the quality of those years. So for instance, there is a, a kind of popular view in healthcare allocation that we should prefer to save the lives of people, to extend the lives of people who can be expected to have a good level of health if their life is saved and prioritize them over people who will have significant health problems and therefore a worse quality of life. So that's the first point, just that even if the idea of getting the most good out of a set of resources seems intuitive, there are further complications to think about. How exactly should we understand that idea of producing the most good? The second point I want to make is precisely this point about fairness. So take that last position that I just described, that we should be focusing on not just the total number of life years that are produced through a healthcare intervention, but also the quality of those life years. There are various questions about fairness that might be generated by this position. So for instance, we might wonder who gets to judge the quality of a particular life? How do we decide whether one life is better than another? We also might want to think about how various people come to be in the position that they are expected to have a worse quality of life going forward than other people. For instance, if it's because of ongoing or prior injustice, we might worry that we are engaging in a form of what the philosopher John Harris has called double jeopardy, where people have a worse quality of life expected because they've been treated unjustly, 
and then are treated unjustly again by being sorted lower down the priority list. Um, if we turn to vaccination, this might seem like less of a problem because in general, uh, producing the most good, a kind of efficiency view, is going to, in vaccination terms, tell us to prioritize the most vulnerable, right? So whereas in access to intensive care, we might think that producing the most good means focusing on those who are easier to benefit and therefore better off, in vaccination terms, the opposite seems to be true, right? We will produce more goods in a vaccination priority by focusing on those who are most vulnerable and therefore worst off. However, it's not quite true that this problem just vanishes when we come to vaccination. Take the following example. If our goal, if our maximizing goal is to vaccinate as many people as we can as quickly as possible, as seems to be the goal in most countries, including the UK, this might lead us to prioritize giving vaccines to those who are easier to reach, easier to access. That's going to include things like people who have more spare time or who can easily go to a doctor's surgery or a vaccination center at the last minute when they're called in to do so. And it's going to disadvantage people who, for instance, have uh, care duties or care, care work that they have to perform or jobs that they have to perform. So again, this focus on efficiency, even in the case where we should be prioritizing those who are most vulnerable, might lead us still to raise worries about fairness. Okay, um, I turn now to a separate tension, the second kind of relationship that I want to talk about, which is this three-way relationship between the individual, the state, and community. And of course, we might understand community in a variety of ways, right? We might think about the national community, we might think about our local community or regional community, and of course, we might think about the global community, which is something I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I think the most obvious way in which this kind of freeway tension has, has uh, kind of asserted itself during the past year has been in the debate over lockdown, right? It's hard to get away from the ongoing argument that seems to be um, kind of dominating our lives where we appear to have quite a polarized set of views, at least in this country, between those who are very skeptical of lockdown and those who are extremely in favor of it. Now, of course, as with any apparent polarization, there are undoubtedly going to be a variety of views in the middle of that spectrum who perhaps aren't making themselves as widely heard as the extremes. But certainly the kind of national discourse in the media seems to have been dominated by these two strong views. So I'm not going to kind of take a position on lockdown because uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk about my views on it in in our discussion session. But rather than me just saying what I think, I think maybe one more helpful thing I might do is just make an observation about the way this debate has gone on. And I think one thing we can say is that to some extent, the advocates of both of those extremes, both of those kind of polarized positions have been slightly talking past each other. And they've been doing that because I think each of them has been focused on a different relationship. So, start off with those who are kind of broadly pro lockdown, pro the idea that the government should be engaging in quite significant restrictions on our civil liberties in order to um, prevent the spread of the virus. Um, a lot of the arguments that we see in that context are about the individual's duty to their community, right? So the individual's responsibility not to behave in ways that will lead to a spread of infection and lead to fellow members of our community becoming ill and potentially dying. Now, I think that's a really important relationship that we need to think about, the, relation, the relationship between the individual and their community. And there are various questions we might ask about this relationship. For instance, we might wonder whether the individual responsibility extends as far as following the rules, even when you might think that in this particular case, breaking the rules won't have any harmful effects. So for instance, take the various points at which there's been a rule against meeting one other individual outside and sitting with them uh, at a distance wearing masks, right? At various points during the past year, that's been illegal in the UK. Now you might think 
that even when that was illegal, you were very unlikely to spread the virus by doing that, right? If you kept a good distance from someone, met them outside, both wore masks, you would be really unlikely to spread the virus. So you'd be unlikely by breaking the rules in that case to actually cause any harm. So there are questions about whether there is any duty in a case like that to obey the rules anyway. And you might appeal, for instance, to a duty of solidarity, a duty to do what everyone else is doing, to follow the rules simply because the rest of the community is following them. Of course, more importantly than that, there are going to be many, many more occasions where breaking the rules might lead to some harm, where if you do something that seems safe enough, you are nonetheless going to cause harm to somebody else in your community, even if you're not aware of it. So, as I say, that relationship between the individual and community is an important ethical relationship when we're thinking about um, pandemic ethics. But it sometimes gets, I think, slightly confused or conflated with a completely different, although overlapping, relationship, which is between the individual and the state. So lockdown skeptics, those who are kind of more opposed to lockdown, I think are focusing less on the relationship between individual and community and more on this relationship between individual and state. So even if you think that individuals have these various responsibilities towards their community, local community, national community, whatever it might be, there are still separate questions to ask about the extent to which the state can legitimately enforce those obligations, right? So even if we accept, as I think we should, that individuals have various responsibilities to others not to spread the virus, we might still ask to what extent the state is justified in enforcing those responsibilities through coercive restrictions on our liberties. Um, and there are various positions we might take here, right? We might think on one end of the scale, take an extremely pro-liberty view and say that the state has no right to uh, force me not to do anything that I don't want to do, even if I oughtn't do it. On the other end of the scale, we might take an extreme uh, view on, on uh, uh, the opposite uh, kind of case, that the state, where it feels it's necessary, has an absolute right to restrict my civil liberties if it's for the common good. But there are still various kinds of uh, more specific ethical questions that we might ask about the way the state goes about enforcing our pandemic responsibilities. So for instance, we might wonder whether the state has followed what is generally seen to be a widely accepted rule in medical ethics, that when you are restricting someone's liberties for the common good or for the greater good, you must take the least restrictive route possible. So we might wonder whether the state has done enough, whether the government has done enough to consider whether the measures they're taking are the least restrictive possible. Similarly, we might worry about whether enforcement of these rules has been ethically acceptable. So even if we accept that the state has a legitimate justification to set various kinds of restrictions on our civil liberties, we might still want to ask whether there are problems with enforcement. So for instance, it's a general problem if a very wide, widely applying law, a law which applies to so many aspects of our everyday behavior, is then applied in a kind of patchwork fashion by different police forces or even by different police officers. We might worry that where so much discretion is given to the police to enforce particular laws, then we are potentially going to end up with arbitrary enforcement, where enforcement depends more on, um, or at least in some cases, depends more on biases by individual officers than it does on any kind of principal reasons behind enforcing or not enforcing the rule in a particular case. The final point I think it's worth making about this is just that um, there's been a lot of focus on individual responsibility when it comes to the pandemic, but it's worth just thinking about how individual responsibilities fit into the question of whether the state and community have fulfilled their responsibilities. So for instance, many people think, and indeed the government has often emphasized, that individuals have various kinds of responsibilities to behave in certain ways. But in philosophy, we generally argue that the responsibility depends on two conditions. It depends on you having a certain level of control over your behavior, and it depends on your ability to know what you ought to do. So the government has been accused, for instance, of not being clear in its advice. 
and in giving inconsistent advice. So if the state doesn't fulfill its responsibility to give consistent and clear advice, we might want to ask what that does or what that says about individual responsibilities. Okay, finally, because I think we are kind of nearly at time, I'll just briefly touch on this relationship between the nation and the world. This is probably the most topical of these three tensions um, in the sense that there's a lot of this stuff in the news right now. So we've seen, for instance, worries about whether the EU is going to blockade exports of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we've also seen accusations that wealthy countries, including the UK, have attempted to block moves to make it easier for lower income countries to produce their own um, supplies of the vaccine. Now, in political philosophy, there's a very old uh, debate between two positions on this kind of issue. On the one hand, we have nationalists who argue that primarily our ethical obligations are to our fellow nationals, that is, to people who reside or are citizens of, citizens of the same country as us. On the other hand, we have a group who are typically called cosmopolitans, who think that actually our primary ethical obligations are to people as fellow humans and that the particular country that you belong to is largely ethically irrelevant or should be a kind of side issue. So we've, I think, seen quite a lot of concerns about vaccine nationalism being raised during the course of the pandemic. And these headlines, I think, show various kinds of issues that look like forms of vaccine nationalism. And on one level, this is just a kind of repeat of the moral argument about between nationalists and cosmopolitans. Should particular governments and should those of us who live in a particular country prioritize our own first? Should we focus on our fellow nationals first? Or should we take a more global approach and think that actually vaccines should be delivered in terms of vulnerability and need, irrespective of where people come from? It's just worth noting, just to kind of finish, that actually this may be a less clear case of the debate between nationalism and cosmopolitanism than it first seems because there are also self-interested reasons for wealthy countries to want to think twice about a very strong form of vaccine nationalism. It's not in our best interests if lower income countries are unable to get their vaccination programs started and end up with serious problems in terms of uh, the progression of the virus and maybe new variants being generated and potentially being re-imported re back into this country. So in this case, it seems like we might actually have a potential point of agreement between the nationalist and the cosmopolitan on pragmatic grounds. Even if the nationalist thinks that there isn't a strong moral case for helping people in other countries get their vaccination program started, they should perhaps think that there is a self-interested case for doing so. Okay, um, I've gone on a 